Three-time Academy Award winner Oliver Stone has directed some of Hollywood's biggest films. He took on the Vietnam War in Born on the Fourth of July. I fought for my country. I am a Vietnam veteran. And Platoon. He explored the world of big finance in Wall Street. You slash and burn, you buy everything inside until 22. Then call me. He's directed films about three U.S. presidents, Nixon, Bush, and Kennedy. Kennedy's motor made a turn from Maine on to Houston. That's gonna be a turkey shoot. He's also directed, produced, and narrated a television documentary series called The Untold History of the United States, and he's co-authored a companion book of the same name with historian Peter Kuznick. I sat down with Oliver Stone and Peter Kuznick in Washington this week. Oliver Stone, Peter Kuznick, welcome to the show. Oliver, let me start with you and let's talk about this, this television series that you've produced, The Untold History of the United States. It's an acclaimed series, well received around the world. But why Untold? Why does America need a television series called Untold History? These stories were, many of them were headlines at one point or another, but they've been thoroughly forgotten by most of the American public and they've had no effect on our foreign policy or domestic policy. So they, in a sense, unlearned histories. And I think we use the word uh, in a metaphorical sense. It's un misunderstood. We, don't, we haven't understood the implications of our foreign policies, especially around the world, since 1898, from 1898 to 2013, which has been increasingly imperialist, although we don't use that terminology in America. Peter Kuznick, uh, what is your sense of how young Americans see the history of America, especially from World War II? The first problem is that they don't see the history of America. And according to the National Report Card in 2011, American high school seniors came in lowest of all subject areas in their understanding of U.S. history. Worse in U.S. history than in math, than in science, and all the other areas we talk about as being a crisis in education. So the first problem is that they don't see history. They're not interested in history. The history they get in schools is boring, and they're, they're asked to memorize a lot and the interesting parts of it are left out very, very often. Their view of post-World War II U.S. history tends to be the United States as the triumphant power, the good guys in every situation, sometimes making a mistake, but our heart is always in the right place. It's what we call American exceptionalism, this idea that the United States is motivated, unlike any other country, by wanting to spread freedom and democracy. And the kids get bored by that story. They know it's a fairy tale. To some extent, they know it's a fairy tale. And, and it's this triumphalist view of the United States. I'd go further. I would just say, you know, we have a young adult edition. You're talking about young people. And it's important. That's our, the next generation. We want to hit that. We, my, I have three children. He has three. We wrote this for that generation. But we could say adults, too. They don't understand that World War II, that the, uh, the Russians, the Soviet Union, contributed greatly to the victory of World War II. And we've never acknowledged that in our histories. We really haven't. And as a result, uh, the Cold War set in. And we've always accused and blamed the Russians for having initiated the Cold War and having ma uh, malignant intentions. That's an accepted, an accepted theory, not only among young people, but certainly the older statesmen of our generation. It's just accepted. And we have gone and deconstructed all the events of 1945, 43, 44, very important, month by month, to try to understand how this Cold War started and how this binary attitude has controlled American thinking. And we find that it's not just communism. It's good versus evil guys. It's whether whoever, when the, when the Soviet empire disappeared, we found new enemies right away, whether it was Noriega in Panama or uh, Hussein in Iraq, and now, once again, the recycling of the, the Russia as the as the evil force, as is China, by the way. So this is an ongoing problem for the United States. And we, we look at ourselves, we look in the mirror, and that's the hardest thing to do for American people, look in the mirror and see yourself. Well, let's talk about one part of American history with which you were closely involved, the Vietnam War. You fought in the Vietnam War. You're a decorated veteran. You made movies about the Vietnam War, Platoon, uh, the 4th of July. Uh, that war is now being commemorated, the 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. The Pentagon's involved in that very closely. Right. Uh, they're rolling out all the publicity. And I want to read you something that was in the New York Times. It says, the Pentagon website largely describes a war of valor and honor that would be unrecognizable to many Americans who fought in and against it. It doesn't cover the protests. It doesn't cover the Senate <coughs> hearings. It calls the Milai massacre the Milai incident. <laughs> is yeah. this the Pentagon airbrushing history? Yes, it is. 
And I've, got, I've lived with this all my life, whether it's the Korean War and certainly in Vietnam, uh, the, the, the movie Platoon, as you mentioned, uh, Born on the Fourth of July, Heaven and Earth, I did three movies, all looked at the underside of that war, at the, uh, the shadows, at the victims of the war, whether they're Vietnamese peasant or whether it was an American soldier who became a paraplegic or in Platoon, whether it was the civil war between American troops with each other. We have never dealt with that war. We've never understood that war. We never apologized. When my movie Platoon came out, it was an underdog against the movie Rambo, the Chuck Norris movies, Missing in Action, about missing American soldiers in Vietnam, were far more popular and made far more, much more money than Platoon ever made. We forget that. So Americans uh, have a still very black, white, heroic, bad guy versus uh, good guy attitude about Vietnam as well as all the recent wars. But, but, the, the, but the other thing to point out about that is that, whereas for our generation, the Vietnam War is something that was considered to be, some people considered it a tragedy, some people a mistake, some people aberration, but some of us considered it a series of war crimes, that it was a, just a nightmarish kind of war. The younger kids don't know that anymore. They don't learn about it. According to the latest Gallup poll, 51% of 18 to 29-year-olds in this country think the Vietnam War was not a mistake, think the Vietnam War should have been fought. 51%. Yeah, but what do they know? That's the, where the education comes in. They know very, very little. In. And I ask them what they know, and I ask them how many Americans died in the war and how many Vietnamese. And they say uh, about 50,000 Americans. Sometimes they're close to that, sometimes more. But they think that 100,000 Vietnamese died in the war. When Marvin McNamara came into my class, he says that he accepts that 3.8 million Vietnamese died in the war. But American kids don't know that. So maybe that's why they think of it as, as a good war, a necessary war. Well, Oliver, if you look at the way American history is taught in schools today, that Americans defeated the Nazis, that they defeated Japanese imperialism, that they defeated... And the Italian atomic bombs fascism. ended World War II, which we take issue with, too. Right. Is isn't that a distortion of history? We feel it is, but you know, you have to prove your case. This is why this book is 800 pages and why this book is 400 pages because, and the Young Readers edition is probably less, is because we want to make this case. It's a crucial case. We cannot understand 2014 unless we understand 1945. That's what we're saying. America's profile, its way of doing business changed radically after World War II. It really did. Prior to World War II, of course, we were still expansionary, but much less so. Well, let's talk about one of the things you mentioned, the uh, atomic bombs that were dropped yes. on Japan. Uh, you do say in the series that it was unnecessary for these That's bombs right. to be dropped. At that time, Jap Japan was about to capitulate, that the Soviets were very close uh, to invading Japan. Yes. Yet they, they had invaded, uh, the, they the, had invaded uh, China, Japan, but yeah. yet they dropped the bombs. Why? Uh, Peter is an expert in, in nuclear affairs and atomic affairs. He studied this issue. He studied the science. Why don't you give me a, a quick, brief answer? Quick, brief answer to why we dropped the bombs. Uh, there's confusion about that. On some level, Truman probably did think it might speed up the end of the war, and he wanted to because the Soviets were coming into the war, and we had promised them basically what they had lost in the Russo-Japanese War, all these concessions they were going to get, and he thought if he could end the war sooner, then they wouldn't get in on the kill, as he said. However, his other motive was to send a signal, send a message to the Soviet Union. The Soviets knew better than anybody how desperate the Japanese were. The Japanese were trying to get the Soviets to intervene on their behalf to get better surrender terms. And so when the United States, knowing that, knowing the Japanese were defeated, knowing that the Russians were coming in, still dropped the atomic bomb, the message to Russia was that the United States is so ruthless in pursuing its goals that it's going to do anything it can and, and that it's going to do the same to the Soviet Union. And the thing is that that's exactly how Stalin interpreted it. That's exactly how the people around Stalin interpreted it, that the bomb was dropped as much on the Soviet Union as it was on Japan, if not more. The oh. Japanese economy was devastated. They, had, they would have fought a few more weeks, perhaps, a few more months, but the fact was the Americans could not invade the mainland for three months until November. In those three months, the Japanese probably would not have lasted. And if the Russians had been encouraged to come forward and attack the Japanese, it would have been over. The Japanese were more scared of the Russians than they were of us because they seen, had seen what the Russians had done to Nazi Germany, destroyed it. If we look at the period since then, Oliver, uh, you know, the United States has this remarkable marketing machine of portraying themselves to the world as we are the good guys, everybody else are the bad yes, guys. Yes, they're excellent at this. Uh, they're, they're very good very at that. Very powerful. You say in your series that since then, especially when you look at foreign policy, and I'm quoting you here, some profound mistakes have been made. What do you mean by that? 
well, dropping the bomb would be the first one. Thinking you're right about everything and uh, thinking you're the good guy is a huge mistake. But it, the whole attitude we took to the third world, India among them, in the 1950s under John Foster Dulles and Eisenhower, set a horrible precedent for the United States. We were regarded badly by most of the third world, whereas the Soviet Union was regarded in a much better light as a friend to third world ambitions. Uh, so the United States repeatedly in Vietnam, in third world, in its support of colonialism in, in Africa and in Asia and in the Middle East has crossed many ethnic barriers and broken many people's hearts and killed many people. And, we haven't, and we've done it benignly through proxies, whether it's the Shah of Iran or Saudi Arabia. We've always worked. We're very good behind the scenes. I think we're expert at public relations. We're expert at controlling regimes. We got rid of the Iranian regime when it became too independent. We got rid of the uh, Indonesian regime when it became too independent. These are very rich, important countries. We have been manipulating behind the scenes with public relations, advertising firms, money, uh, banks. And to some extent, Hollywood. And Hollywood, our whole culture, well, the Hollywood is being, it's done more innocently, but it's done by people who just have no education, who are making movies because they believe that America is the best place in the world. That's kind of a, you grow up Walt Disney here, you know. Peter, if we look at, and you talked about how American kids are educated, uh, there almost seems to be a pattern here where American kids are taught that the Soviet Union was the great threat, communism was the great threat. When you look back on it now, was that fear justified? No. It was not justified. You have to look at the history through Russian eyes to really understand it. And that begins with the Russian Revolution and the U.S. sending over 10,000 troops into Russia to support the white Russians against the Bolsheviks. That's as early as 1918 and 1919. The United States finally recognizes Russia in 1933 under Franklin Roosevelt. But when Russia is trying to organize the West to stand up with them against fascism, against the spread of Nazism, uh, the United States refuses. We maintain a neutral policy. They're the only ones, really, who are supporting the Republican forces in Spain. So but there's a whole history with the end of the Cold War. It's very, people don't realize that, but Franklin Roosevelt, in 1942, said that we should have four policemen after the war, the United States, the Soviet Union, China, and Britain. And the four of us should work together to maintain the peace. They try to have that vision develop in the United Nations. The United States, and, and Roosevelt in his last cable on this, says that there's no reason why the United States and the Soviets won't remain friends. We have little issues that come up all the time, but we're gonna, we should st not take those seriously. We should look at the big picture and remain friends. Many of the advisors around Roosevelt, not the people who Truman turns to, but the ones around Roosevelt, believe that. And the most prominent among them, of course, was the U.S. Vice President in 1940 to 1944, Henry Wallace. Wallace was the leading spokesperson for the United States and the Soviets working together to change the world in a positive way, to end colonialism, to end hunger and starvation, to end economic imperialism. That was his vision, a vision of peace. And he was toppled by some of the same forces that are going to later topple All right, John he Kennedy. lost the nomination battle. Oliver, you have the American edition of Untold History of the United States. You have the concise edition. You have the Chinese edition. There's also a Russian, Russian edition. edition. Yeah. The Russian edition. Spanish, you have said that Russians have a very different view of World War II. They do. Tell us about that view that they have. That we. Well, they, it was the Great War for them. They lost uh, 25, maybe 28 million people. Uh, their country, the, the civilian population, it was decimated by the by the Nazis, and some of it was openly genocidal. And the, uh, they reset the whole economy during the war behind the Ural Mountains. Stalin withdrew everyone. The, the, the bad guy, the critics call it conscripted labor, but they were fighting for their own lives, the Russians. They knew this was it. They knew they had no support in the West. It was one of the greatest examples in human history of a people with fighting back against an enormous war machine. There was nothing like the German war machine up until that time, except for the United States now with its nuclear arsenal. There's nothing like the Germans. The greatest army, I believe, the world has ever seen. And Churchill, who hated the uh, Russians, gave them credit. He said they tore the guts out of the German war machine. They did it at Stalingrad, they did it at Moscow, and they did it at the Battle of Kursk. When they, and then they pushed the Germans back across the Russian borders. And they could have stopped there and said, we've had enough, and let the Allies and the, and the British and the, fight the rest of the war. And that, well, what would have happened in world history? It's very interesting to think that America, which is so easily blames Russia, I think we would have, America would have lost a million more men 
fighting the Germans if the Russians hadn't kept pushing through Eastern Europe at great cost to themselves into Berlin, where they lost another half million men taking Berlin. This was enormous sacrifice from the Russians, and right away the United States and the, and the, and the English, within months, uh, there was no gratitude at all. And they, and they had promised uh, Stalin they would open a second front. In 42 it was promised, it was promised in 43. Nothing happened until June of 44. So we take all the credit for D-Day in June of 44. By that time, the Russians were halfway to, Mos uh, halfway to Berlin. Right, and the other thing that's also we don't hear a lot about was that the Russians faced far more German divisions. They faced uh, 200 German divisions throughout the war, while the United States and the British faced 10 combined until June of 44. So that's what they faced on D-Day, didn't Which they? Which is why, and Kennedy, in 63, in his American University commencement address, said that what the Russians suffered was the equivalent of the entire United States east of Chicago being destroyed. You know, you talk about the Soviet Union. Well, now we have Russia, and its relationship with the United States is, as we know, nosedived recently. It's a very tense relationship. The United States and its allies have imposed sanctions. Uh, these are two nuclear powers. Uh, and we know that Russia resents the fact that sometimes the United States portrays itself as the winner of the Cold War. Is this relationship going to get worse? Because you've written, Peter, that these are natural allies. They shouldn't be at loggerheads with each other. The, the situation hopefully will not get worse. There are wise forces on both sides right now who are trying to tamp it down a little because they know that this is, these are two nuclear-armed nations and that but from the Russian standpoint, you've got to look back to the 1990s. You've got to look back to the Bush administration when Bush promised Gorbachev that if they let Germany unite, then NATO is not going to move one thumbs width to the east. And what did we do since then? We've, we've incorporated 13 more countries, taken it up right up to Russia's doorstep. We've talked about bringing Ukraine uh, in, and Georgia into NATO. And so from the Soviet Russian standpoint, this is not only a betrayal of what we had promised them, but this is very, very dangerous. It threatened their security. The thing about Russian actions after World War II was they were obsessed with security. They'd been invaded twice through Eastern Europe, through Poland, by the Germans. They were afraid of a revitalized Germany invading them again. Now that's happening, effectively, economically. And they see their security as being threatened. Ukraine, to them, is a fundamental security issue. We are going to have to take a break right now. We're talking to Oliver Stone and Peter Kuznick about their television series and the book they've co-written, The Untold History of the United States. We're going to play you an excerpt from that television series right now. We'll be back with more. Stay with us. You're on The Heat. Hello, I'm Oliver Stone. When I was a young boy growing up in New York City, I thought I received a good education. I studied history extensively, especially American history. It made sense. We were the center of the world. There was a manifest destiny. We were the good guys. Well, I've traveled the world now. I continued my education as an infantryman in Vietnam. I've made a lot of movies, some of them about history. And I've learned a lot more than I once knew. And when I heard from my children what they were learning at school, I was perturbed to hear that they were not really getting a more honest view of the world than I did. We lived much of our lives in a fog, all of us. 